Hello and welcome. I am your host, Lassisi Adedun. Let me welcome you all to another edition of Lagos Environment Webinar Series. Today, we are talking one of the greatest challenging issues facing Nigeria as a country, collapse building. Thank you all for taking your time to join us. Happy Workers' Day. In the past Lovely. centuries, we've seen buildings. Our forefathers have developed pyramids. Our forefathers have developed churches without collapsing. However, that is different from what we have today. Collapse building is one of the major issues affecting urban development. From China to Indonesia, to India, to Nigeria, to Ghana, collapse building is a major factor in urban developments. Why are we having collapse building? Is it a fundamental issue? Is it a corruption issue? Is it a practice issue? We are here today to discuss about collapse building. Thank you for joining us. You are all welcome. Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Workers' Day, and you're welcome to the first edition of EcoEnvironmental TV lecture series in the year 2023. Our dialogue for today focuses on contemporary issues in building, collapse, and its implications for sustainable development in Lagos, Nigeria. Just in case this is your first time joining this show, EcoEnvironTalk TV is a platform created to promote science communication for environmental awareness and advocacy to promote sustainability in Lagos, Nigeria, and Africa. It's my pleasure to be moderating this show, and I hope you're ready for today's conversation. I'm Wande Seriki, a sustainability and climate change professional who is passionate about creating pathways for green growth in Africa. Kindly go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat box and I'll be, I'll, it'll be lovely to meet you all. Building collapse discourse in developing countries tend to follow an internal focal approach. This provides the outlook that these challenges are internal to these countries. It has been argued that not only does the approach create a false impression that developing countries have danger from construction culture, but it also places building safety challenges in those parts of the world over and above the systemic underdevelopment conditions, which interplay with the internal factors actually created, and these make them worse. Without much further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the lead speaker of today's conversation, in no other person of Professor Abimbola Windapo. She's a professor at the Department of Construction Economics and Management, University of Cape Town, she has more than 35 years of experience in practice, teaching and research in the construction industry and projects. She's a professional project manager and mentor registered with South African Council for Project and Construction Management Professionals. She's also registered with the Council of Registered Builders of Nigeria. She's a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Building. Her research, her research is interdisciplinary and focuses on leadership, sustainable economic development, sustainable housing, construction business, and a host of others. She's a distinguished associate of the Royal Academy of Engineering and the recipient of several awards. You're welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Happy Workers' Day, everyone. And thanks for inviting me. Real pleasure. Thank you for being with us, ma'am. Okay, so thank you all very much once again for the invitation. It's indeed an honor and a privilege to be with you here today to present a topic that is very dear to my own heart as well, the issue of building collapse. And so we'll be looking at that topic, contemporary issues in building collapse and its implications for sustainable development of Lagos State. Uh, and I hope you wouldn't mind if I just switch off my video for now to save bandwidth. And thanks for the introduction once again. So I'm from the University of Cape Town, and I bring you warm greetings from Cape Town in South Africa. My presentation will follow this outline, a brief introduction, a look at building collapse and sustainable development, the nexus, and then why building collapse, the issues and challenges, solutions to building collapse, and then the closing thoughts. So let's first start with our introduction to what a building is. So a building is critical to meeting the social, cultural, economic, and environmental needs of people. It also influences the well-being 
the health and security of both the present and future generations. And some scholars have argued that buildings are the hallmark of civilization in any society. And if you remember Maslow's theory, it states that having a shelter is one of the three basic human needs, apart from food and clothing. So a building in the form of a shelter is very important as it meets our social, our cultural, our economic, and our environmental needs. It's also a way in which we can secure wealth for both the present and future generations. So building collapse is a global menace, not only in, not only in Nigeria, we also have, but not in the quantum of what we see in Nigeria. We also see it happening in other countries of the world. So it's a menace due to the spectrum of those cases in the past, and we've had incessant reports across the globe in recent time. So this presentation will examine the contemporary issues in building collapse and what are the implications for sustainable development. So how do we know that a building has collapsed? So a building failure occurs when a building or its components can no longer be relied upon to fulfill its principal function. So it's no longer, so it can be maybe a limited deflection, doesn't have to be a total collapse. So it could be a certain amount of cracking, which could just be said as a defect. So it's not yet a collapse. However, excessive deflection can result in severe damages to the components of the building, the walls, the foundation. So that is a building failure. So we could have some deflection, which is just a defect, but then when it's excessive, when we have excessive deflection, uh, we class it as a building failure. So it happens when the building, there's a total loss of bearing strength, which results in a sudden breakdown, uh, physical deflection or falling apart of the buildings. And there are three categories of building collapse. So you could have a partial collapse. You could have one that is progressive. You could see that the building is collapsing gradually. Then you could have the one that is just sudden, a sudden collapse. Uh, so we could identify building collapse in those three ways. An overview of building collapse in different parts of Nigeria, the reports that we have from 2000 to 2019, and which we can update to 2023 as well, reveals that the residential buildings are more prone to collapse in Nigeria. So what does this infer? This infers that it will lead to more loss, more tragic losses of uh, lives are lost because people reside in buildings. So if it's a commercial uh, structure or an institution and an office building, most likely maybe people will have closed from work or students will have left the school or they wouldn't be there 100% of the time. But when it's a residential building, there are always people in the building every time. So the loss of residential buildings is much more tragic. And when we have more buildings uh, that are residential buildings that, are, that collapse, it's a source of concern to everyone involved. So this should be a source of concern. So where's the link between building collapse and sustainable development? What does, how does building collapse impact sustainable development and how can we link uh, the building collapse with lack of sustainable development? So there are five elements of the principles of sustainable development 
that should be incorporated into building construction. Five elements are identified. And these five elements of the principles of sustainable development as advocated in literature include the selection of durable and sustainable materials that meet defined standards of compliance. So we need to select building materials in such a way that they comply so that they are, they don't break down or are in place for a long time. So good materials that are standard. Then appropriate site selection as well. We have to ensure that the sites we select are sites that are located in appropriate places, uh, places that are not prone to flooding, uh, earthquake regions, so that these buildings will be sustainable and will be there into the future for future generations. Then when we mention use of flexible and durable designs, there are also key components of sustainable development because if a design is flexible, for example, it ensures that the building and other structure can adapt to changing needs and developments over time. So if we need the building to be changed from residential to a commercial building, like a banking hall, if we have a flexible design, it enables us to change the use of that building so that it adapts to changes in an area and in a, in a location, as maybe the value of that area becomes, the value increases, we may need to change that building for other uses that will bring in more income appropriate to the value of the land in the area. So flexible designs ensures that. Then the durable design, on the other hand, enables that the build enables the buildings and other structures to remain in a usable condition for longer periods of time, reducing the need for maintenance and replacement. Proper planning and management of construction activities as aligned to sustainable development in also involves creating a plan that considers the impact of that project on the environment, the local population, and the economy. The plan should include the strategies for which we want to use in constructing the building, the construction methodologies that will be used, and how these uh, construction methodologies are resilient and won't lead to collapse. And then also a fifth element is the proper commissioning of the building systems and equipment before occupation. Commissioning building systems and equipment is also important in the achieving sustainable development because without proper commissioning of the building, the building may not, we may not see the defects. If we don't go through the building to check if there are defects, we may not see the defects. So it ensures that the building is operating at the highest efficiency. Apart from looking at other things like maybe the energy use, the water consumption, and so on. So commissioning verifies that the building will perform efficiently and then it can help identify any issues that may need to be addressed in order to ensure that the building meets sustainability goals. So those are the five elements of the building designs of the principles of sustainable development that should be incorporated into building construction during the inception and planning stage of the building. So if we want our buildings to be sustainable, we have to be thinking about selecting durable materials, uh, using appropriate sites, using flexible designs right from the beginning, having a future goal in mind that this building, we may need to change the use as time goes on. 
uh, having proper planning and managing the construction activities, especially when it comes to construction methodology, and then uh, proper commissioning, checking the buildings to see whether there are defects before it's occupied, and then looking at the building systems and equipment before occupation. So when we mapped the sustainable development principles, those five elements which I've just mentioned, when it is mapped to the construction approach used, when we look at the construction approach, then we see that there's a lack of alignment between uh, those sustainable development principles and the construction approach. The current building construction practices are found not to be sustainable and do not conform to basic elements of sustainable building principles advocated in literature in three main areas. So when we look at the uh, collapsed buildings and the reports received, we will see that there are three areas that stand out. You'll find out that it's mentioned that the building materials used are substandard and unsustainable or unsuitable. For example, maybe unwashed gravels were used, uh, blocks, most of 90% of the blocks that we have in Lagos State, another research found that, that those blocks are not up to standard. So we find use of substandard and unsustainable materials coming up as one of the key uh, factors causing collapse. We also find out that it's, it's also mentioned that there's poor supervision and workmanship and there may be lack of competency in the construction methodologies used and building techniques, supervision skills, uh, generally poor planning and management of the construction activities. And the third one that comes out is the use of inappropriate sites. The sites uh, usually may be building on flood plains. Um, buildings are sited in areas that lack proper drainage. So all these are things that we can see and which are not compliant with the uh, sustainable development principles cited in literature. So the lack of alignment to and compliance with these sustainable construction principles is one of the major things that we'll see causes the building collapse and poor quality buildings. So if we want our buildings to be sustainable, to last into the future, then it has to be compliant every time with those five elements. So just going on further. So let us just look at why building collapse. So I've mentioned those three things and uh, the issues, we can look at the issues and challenges, which I have classified into those four factors, the STEM factors of social factors, technological, environmental, and management. So the social factors relates to the people, their behavior and interactions before, during and after construction. Technological factors are those requirements, specifications, standards and methods of construction. The environmental factors includes any factor, uh, whether abiotic, uh, the sunlight or biotic that can influence the buildings. And then the managerial factors that things that has to do with supervision and coordination of the efforts applied to building construction. So just going deeper into the social factors, the indicators that we have very, uh, the, the impact of those social factors on building collapse Indicators include that we have recalcitrant owners refusing to comply with directives, the clients and developers cutting corners, not engaging the services of registered construction professionals in the design and management of the building construction process, making use of substandard or defective building materials. Some contractors and owners or developers use 
unskilled workers of poor workmanship and they produce shoddy work. There is a lack of technical knowledge on the right construction methods to use, building on land with poor bearing capacity, and then the poor relationship between the design and production team. So that poor relationship is uh, that image that we have here, that model that you see here. So once the construction team and design team, if the design team does not understand the capabilities of the construction team in a local context, if they fail to understand what how they can build, what methods they use, and then they design things that are foreign, it could also lead to building failures. That's what that means. So the context of social factors is that the behavior, it has to do with behavior or interactions which may be hidden and not noticeable. We cannot say, oh, this is what happened. This is why they chose uh, substand substandard or defective building materials. It's in, within a context where we find unethical conduct exists, such as corruption, negligence, bribery, bid courting, and so on. And then maybe the rules and standards available do not really impact on what is done, but is actually counterproductive. And here, this slide shows a causal loop of a system dynamic model to show the influence of the degree of alignment or compliance to sustainable corruption or construction principles and on sustainable practices, the behavior, what influences the behavior on building uh, projects, what influences the building collapse or the building performance. So what we find, what this uh, causal loop shows, because I did this kind of, I used the, a model to model the economy based on the different economic periods in Nigeria. So economy also has an impact on the social factors, on behavior. So economic policies enacted by governments could affect the rate of building collapse and then not only the general economic conditions, but it could also affect the rate of building collapse. So if we see the period where there's lack of money or there's high interest rates, then people start to cut corners because of the economic conditions. So what we found out that in the periods of economic recession in Nigeria, it will exacerbate the lack of alignment to and compliance with sustainable construction principles by the construction industry stakeholders. The model suggests and that is also from research and modeling of the building collapse trends with the economic conditions, that construction industry stakeholders tend to cut corners and underperform. You have more building collapse during recessionary periods, which is likely to lead to more cases of building collapse in the future because of cutting corners. Then just briefly through the technological factors, the use of more conventional than contemporary practices, especially around site technology, formwork technology, and scaffold technology, which has been found to also lead to more collapse. There are no guidelines, concepts or code in Nigeria that pronounces in clear terms that this is the composition of the design team, that this is what the design team should look like. There are no guidelines for that. It may be resident, we may have that, those guidelines within our professional institutions, but no national guidelines. So everyone constitutes their design team the way they see fit. Uh, nothing about how do we do things like buildability appraisal, how do we apply the standards? What are the guidelines for applying the standards? What are the pres prescripts? What are the uh, procedures for applying standards 
to building construction. No code addresses the issues of either design or construction approaches, what are the best approach to construction to achieve the overall project quality objectives, construction industry and societal objectives. So we do not have any, we may have a national building code, but it hasn't yet been broken down into guidelines or prescripts that this is what you have to do to do. This is the blocks you have to use or something, or this is how you have to use it in terms of construction methodology in order to achieve these objectives, these quality objectives. Uh, we find out also that properties of 90% of uh, sand creek blocks produced are lower than is specified and other materials as well. Nothing to check, although we have the standards organization of Nigeria, but these blocks are still being produced and they are still being used. Uh, many contractors are not aware of the techniques involved in construction or the science of materials used. So most of them are just in business. They don't know the science behind the materials used. So moving forward, when we look at environmental factors, uh, building deterioration or depreciation can also be traced to the material elements as well as the composites used in construction and how they degrade, how they wear them. So these materials exhibit different reactions when exposed to the element, man-made conditions, and how they are used. So they can wear, these materials wear and tear depending on where they are exposed to. So if you have uh, buildings or steel construction, for example, beside the beach in Lagos, where they're exposed to salt, the salt contents for the beach from the beach may uh, where these materials become may corrode. The materials start corroding. So the geographical location and prevailing conditions of the immediate environment environs of the building have a significant effect on the materials that should be specified. Building on floodplains and in waterlogged areas as well will lead to the settlement of the building in time. And sometimes when this settlement is uneven, it will lead to the total collapse of the building. And then we could also look at the managerial factors. In all the building collapse cases documented, no professional builder has been found. So professional builders are also one of the professional professions recognized by the government in the construction industry. They have, there was none engaged in the planning and management of the construction works of those buildings that have been documented as collapsed buildings. Also, it's found that the use of incompetent engineers either during design or supervision stage uh, an improper design will lead to failure of the buildings, having improper, incompetent contractors, making use of faulty construction technologies, especially when it comes to the um, shoring and then the support, formwork support for concrete uh, structures and concrete slabs and elements, poor town planning review and development and monitoring control as well. Limited monitoring and control of work under construction is also a factor. The non-compliance with specifications or standards by developers and contractors and inadequate supervision have also been found to lead to building failure. Moreover, there is a gap in the management of construction uh, projects in Nigeria, which has also been found out in literature to lead to building failure. So my take on how do we prevent building collapse? So I have like five slides that uh, lists the types of prevention of building collapse leading to more sustainable construction and more sustainable development. So the first one is the need for sensitization and awareness of building collapse consequences, the consequences for non-compliance and benefits of compliance needs to be communicated. So there needs to be sensitization. So 
what is the consequences of non-compliance, which is the loss of building, loss of lives, and then the benefits of compliance, which is like sustainable development. We have uh, things to show. Uh, we don't have loss in terms of properties and lives uh, through our practices. Then revision of existing building codes in Nigeria to incorporate sustainable construction principles like the social, economic, environmental, and technical principles that is more alive, more, uh, not only the codes, but we have more prescription with the codes as well. Development of bylaws for Lagos, metropolis, and other metropolis in Nigeria based on the geographical location because the location also differs. So what can be applicable in Lagos, what is necessary, like building, like I mentioned, water uh, flooded plains, the ocean, the salty water, and so on, has an impact which may not be the same for buildings being constructed in Abuja, for example. Then government must maintain a modernized, efficient, and user-friendly statutory building control regime. Modernized by maybe making use of more uh, auto automated processes, uh, no need to be submitting paper documents, but more efficient. Um, the building permits approvals should be processed quickly, and then there must be more uh, checks and balances, the building control regime should be much more proactive instead of being reactive. Not after it has been built, then the structures are demolished. There must be more proactiveness. So this also leads to this uh, uh, other bullet point here that adequate monitoring and control of construction work, government and regulatory arm of professional bodies can be involved in that. Then more maintenance of existing buildings, there needs to be inspection and um, review and documenting the condition of our existing buildings, if they are still fit for purpose. Use of smart technologies, uh, such as sensors in monitoring the condition of existing structures. We can make use of smart technology in team coordination, monitoring and evaluating the construction process to make it void of risks. So we could use smart technology in coordination, creating awareness of the building structural behavior and unanticipated environmental phenomena. Use of only construction materials and components certified by the Standard Organization of Nigeria, which also speaks to our sustainable development principles where we have to make use of standard materials that do not deteriorate quickly. And then use of appropriate approach to the planning and management of construction projects. So when we uh, look at uh, the use of the construction management documents, the quality management plan, like a professional builder, I said one of the requirements for approval. So they'll have documented the quality management plan, the different activities of within the construction process. So what are those activities? What's quality? What's the objective of the activity in terms of quality? What's the, what is the end goal? What is the standard? Do we, what standard do we need at the end of this process? It needs to be documented. Then also the preparation of a method statement, for example, by builders, the professional builders will also identify those areas which may not be safe and which more focus, there needs to be more focus on those areas and how can we prevent collapse and ensure that those activities are done in a standard way. So this method statement will outline how the construction work will be undertaken, what are those risks involved and how these risks will be addressed and this should also be a document required and submitted in anticipation of building approval. 
Then the ethical considerations, which are things that are on, which are hidden. Every aspect of building planning process require proper supervision and quality input by all the registered professionals in the construction industry. Clients, contractors, and developers should be enlightened to use professionals and not cut corners to save costs. Failure to do this would be tantamount to taking undue risks with their lives and properties. And then we should also inform the clients and developers that there, there are soft costs because most clients and developers do not kind of are not aware or try to disregard the soft costs. That is payments to consultants on projects. So payment to consultants on projects is usually about 20% of the total project costs. So these soft costs must be set aside by the clients and developers for proper engagement, proper monitoring and control of the projects by the consultants. So they must make provisions for the soft costs. If your building costs 1 billion, then you must set aside at least 200 million to engage appropriate professionals, the designers, the engineers, the architects, the construction and the build professional builders to help in monitoring and controlling the processes, the building construction process as it unfolds. So adequate provision must also be made for those soft costs. We've talked about use of competent construction professionals for the design and supervision of the works. So it's from these uh, soft costs that the developer and client is able to afford the use of those competent construction professionals to design and supervise the works. The scope of services and responsibilities of the registered professionals to also be clearly outlined in the revised building code. Then the ethics of the profession should also be maintained. Registered professionals should not undertake work for which they lack competence. They should only undertake work for which they know how to do it. They should not take on work for which they lack competence. And to ensure the competence of the professionals, professional bodies, and registration councils in the construction industry, working with the planning authorities and the government should always provide specialized training to update the skills and knowledge of the professionals through continuous professional development courses. So in closing, in the future, what I see is that it's likely that the construction industry stakeholders will be reluctant to do away with unsustainable practices because it's also already part of them. Therefore, we'll, I envisage that there'll be more cases of building collapse. And this will happen if the government does not take proactive action by ensuring and enforcing compliance with sustainable, with the sustainable construction principles. They are just fine if we ensure that we use good materials, uh, we ensure that the sites are selected appropriately and proper design is used based on the site that has been selected. If we use flexible and durable designs, if we properly plan and manage our construction activities and if these buildings are properly commissioned, then we may, able, we may be able to arrest the incidences of building collapse. So just to know that building collapse has very serious implications for the socioeconomic development of Lagos State and Nigeria as a whole, and must be tackled decisively in order to, to secure a more sustainable future. Pre prevention, they say, is often said to be better than cure. Thank you all for your attention.
Thank you very much for listening. And I'll stop sharing. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ma. We are very grateful for that depth knowledge about collapse building. In fact, we, as a professional in the built sector, there are a lot of things we take into uh, likely in this part. And I can see that some of them have been highlighted in, in, in your presentation. Uh, just a recap of the key uh, points. Uh, the use of STEM, you know, basically, yeah, looking at factors contributing to collapse building and she, she has been able to make it uh, for us by putting it in a term that everybody is common with, but using it in, in collapse building, social, technological, environment, and, and management. Yeah, if it has to be with cutting corners, if it has to be with corruption, uh, technology using the best approach and environmental. Yeah, if people want to build close to water body, people want to build close to ocean, but the, the cement they are using, the materials they are using, do they comply to the environment which they, they want to build? Also management, yes. Most builders don't want to pay for cost. Uh, they, they always don't want to pay for professionals. And you, in, in the presentation, you said, 20% should also be, be set aside for, for professionals in, in, in that. Also, to prevent last building, sensitization is very, very important. And building code is, is also very, very important. Yes, Nigeria, we have a national building code, but do everybody in the built sector know about the national building code? I, I, I'm fortunate to be part of people going for inspection in in multi-story buildings. And I tend to ask, okay, they said they have fire installation, we have uh, electrical installation. Give me the code, the specification of the code you use in, in the installation. Hardly could, even the designer, the architect and, and the engineers who are involved in the building, hardly could, could they just made mention. Yes, you are designing a building, but the materials you are using for, for the building comes from different sector. Some, of, some materials are from China, some materials are from Germany, some materials are from UK. Each of these countries have different uh, codes for their materials. So if you are building and you are building materials from different countries that have different uh, building uh, code specification, that can also affect uh, the, the integrity of, of the building. Uh, smart technology, yes, we, we have to start using technology to, to, to monitor. Monitoring is very, very important in, in, in buildings. And uh, these are things she, she has highlighted in the presentation. Thank you very much, Ma. Before we continue, uh, we would like to watch a, a small video. So my opinion on building collapse, personally, I feel like uh, two things are, you know, basically causes this stuff. 
First of all, when we get laborers who do not have enough experience or do not know what it takes to actually build a house, I mean, I feel like most people just, you know, the fact that you are cheap, when they hear that, oh, this person is saying 20,000 and here they are saying 10,000, ah, to them, only 10,000, yeah, better or why? Because it is cheaper. But you're not thinking of the fact that this is a place that you are actually going to live in. I don't know, maybe alone, but with your family. So the fact that something is cheap does not mean it is best. So try as much as possible to get people with experiences. Personally, for me, that's what I feel. Secondly, I feel like most people want to build houses that are very tall. Why not just build a bungalow? If you build a bungalow, a house is a house. As long as you're happy staying in it, it is a house. You don't have to build seven-story buildings or five-story buildings or ten. It doesn't have to be big. If your house is too big, except now, wahala. Before you start tracing one person in the house, why not build something very small, comfortable, and you are sure that, oh, yes, my security in here is safe. So stop building things that are too big, too tall. Build something very, very comfortable for yourself. And I feel like um, the, for the government, right, I don't know if we can uh, form like an association. I mean, I feel like if some people, if there are people in, I don't know if there are people, but if there are people in charge of laborers or an association that are in charge of laborers, they will be able to pick people with experience. They will be able to know that, oh, this person is a laborer and this person is not a laborer. So if the government can come up with an association of people and put them in charge of these cases, I feel like buildings will not be collapsing because a lot of people are actually dying, which doesn't make any sense. If your people are dying and you are just looking, I'm like, bro, like, really? So please, try as much as possible. Get some people in charge of laborers. If anybody wants to build a house, maybe they should come to a certain place, in a certain place to get, you know, oh, I want to build a house. Oh, you know, is it a bungalow? Is it a two-story building? What do you want to build exactly? So certain people for certain, for maybe for uh, bungalows, and there are certain people for two, three-story buildings. I feel like that, that's going to be better. So that's, that's my opinion on that. Thank you very much. My opinion about the whole building collapse in Nigeria is the fact that I feel the corruption is eating deep in the country to the extent whereby um, our governments are not even doing what they're supposed to do. Those who have been put in power are not monitoring the stores they're supposed to monitor. Because I feel we have um, this agency that looks into building and all. So the fact that I don't think they monitor these, um, these developers, they use um, low quality materials to do the whole work. And by so doing, they're endangering the lives of Nigerians, which is um, totally wrong. I feel the government don't care because if they care, they will take every agency serious. And if they take everything serious, definitely the whole building collapse will not be happening. Take, for example, your building on a weak soil. You're building a five, six story building on a weak soil. How do you expect it to last long and all? So I believe the government should look into it to protect the lives of women in Nigerians. Thank you. In respect to the building collapsing in uh, Lagos, I think it's becoming uh, too rampant, unlike before. Well, it's something that has solution to, you know, because if, when I heard of the one that just happened recently, mostly the one of uh, Banana Island, I was like, oh, Banana Island, having something like that. I think is the government needs to sit down to look into all these things. And again, it's from the developers. Because you know the way the country is now. Everybody wants to eat and just go like that. They are not doing standard jobs. You give them money to develop a place, to do other things. But they want to get out of it. That is what is going on. Whether you like it or not, that is exactly what is going on. So I need the, go the government should sit down to, as in, to strategize laws, rules, to govern buildings, as in, before you build a house in Lagos, you have to follow some rules. If you cannot meet up, don't do it. I'm um, talking about collapsed building here in Nigeria. I can say um, it is as a cause of maybe low expertise in the field of construction here in Nigeria. And most people, most people, like, people tend to, people, like, want to spend less, eh? In, in, after being awarded contract, they want to uh, like have more gains and use inferior materials to build houses. And these are one of the basic basic courses I can say. And some they don't have that level of expertise of the kind of construction they are doing, and they are they are just there. They are doing it because they want to make money, not because they know much about it. So 
one of the solutions I can say to this collapse within we've been experiencing for the past few years here in Nigeria, most especially in Lagos State, due to Lagos State being the center here in Nigeria, and also people, um, people, people look up to Lagos State. So one of the major causes and solutions I can see to is that the government should look more into the construction, this, um, um, looking into the construction and make sure people who are constructing have the possible level of expertise which is required of them so that's the major solution i think and each and every materials which will be used in the construction site should be tested and trusted it should be it shouldn't be inferior to what is expected thank you yeah my own opinion about the collapse building is that um the way buildings are collapsing in the city of lagos these days is is, is unthinkable it's just unacceptable in a society like this and at this time so it is the responsibility of the regulatory agency to ensure that those developers, those who are, who are doing those works, should be able to get the right materials, uh, get the right regulations with everything that is necessary you know, to have a decent society. In a situation where, whereby building is collapsing every now and then, it's, 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 it's nonsensical in a society like this at, at this time. So to me, to me, it's just laughable. The government is not serious. The regulatory agency is not serious. Everybody is just playing by the gallery. That is what it looks like. Thank you. Oh, oh, my suggestion. You know, I am not an expert in the um, in that line. You know, per se. But I think it is the duty of the government and the regulatory agency to fine tune the way forward. I'm not just having this kind of mess every now and then. That's the point. I'm not actually a, a professional to begin to, you know, tell what to do in that sense. But they should do things right and get it done. For example, when you go to the cities of the world, you see buildings that are, I mean, 200-story building, 100-something story building, and every now and then you are hearing that 25-story building is collapsing and people are being entrapped and killed and all of that stuff. So it is not acceptable. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome back to the show and thank you very much professor windako for your for your comments for your for your presentation um very enlightening um so now we're moving into the panel session and i'll be presenting the panel members to you um professor windako you're also a member of the panel so please um would would we you're invited to please uh, make comments as appropriate. Thank you, ma'am. Um, our first panel member is Engineer Yodili Balariwa. He's the chairman, Nigerian Institution of Civil Engineers Lagos Chapter. We also have Town Planner Adebisi Adidire as a panelist who is a consultant for excellence with over 25 years of experience who currently serves as the vice president of Association of Town Planning Consultants of Nigeria and is the immediate past chairman of Nigerian Institute of Town Planners. He's a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Town Planners, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Corporate Marketing and Management of Nigeria, and also a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Administrators and Researchers of Nigeria. As of today, over 50 town planners went through his tutelage and is also a mentor to a countless young planners. You're welcome, sir. Another panel member is engineer Etinosa Osadolo. He is the principal consultant of Etaten Engineering Limited with experience in the design, construction, and supervision of civil engineering constructions and infrastructure. He's the past general secretary of the Nigerian Institute of Civil Engineers, Potako chapter from 2021 to 2022. Engineer Osadolo is a devout Christian and loves the game of football. You're welcome, sir. Um, we have we also have a contribute a contributing panel member who is builder Dr. Olufemi Akinshala. He's a chief lecturer and director of research and applied technology and innovation units of Yaba College of Technology, a one-time honorable general secretary of Nigerian Institute of Building National, current national chairman of Nigerian Institute of Builders in Facilities Management 
and is the author of Building Surveying Practice in Nigeria. You're welcome, Saz and Mark. Okay, so moving into the panel session now, I'll be starting with you, um, Tamplan Adedure. Um, how important is continuous training and development of artisans and tradesmen in the construction industry, particularly that technical education has been relegated in secondary schools and tertiary institutions in Nigeria. And also from the video that we watched, we did from public opinion, we've seen that um, lack of technical expertise is a common, is a contributing factor to, to building collapse. And also from Professor Windaco's um, lecture, we did see that lack of technical know-how also contributing to this. So what do you have to say to this, sir? Uh, let me first of all appreciate the presenter, the Professor Abimbola Windakwa, because he has extracted all the challenges we are having in the, uh, as a, a result of building collapse. Uh, training of artisans are very, very important as regards to building collapse. And if you look at the also, you realize that we have professionals and we have artisans. But honestly speaking, most of this job, the greater percentage of this job have been carried out by the artisans. And if you look at the quantum of training they have, it's very little compared with a large number of development that is going on in the state. Unlike in the past, we have people that are learning this job, masons, carpentry work, iron bending, name it painting, POP, and all the rest. But what we realize today is that even the school are not training these artisans again. We don't have more of technical colleges around. Even the secondary school we are having, they don't deal with all these Unlike I could remember when I was in secondary school, we have been taught how to draw building plans and all the rest. But today is no longer in existence. So there is need for us to have a curriculum that we incorporate into the system where artisans will be training. And looking at the menace of this building collapse, you now realize that we may have engineers on site, but how many of them are, are, are readily available on site? By the time they only go there, maybe once, two, three times in a week, you left the artisans working on site. And where there is no adequate supervision, the, the resultant effect is to do what they like. And that is why it is very necessary for us to incorporate training of assistants in our schools. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your for your insights and your response to that question. Um, just a few, a few, a few announcements. Um, I've just been informed that we have um, engineer Adeyemi, a former a former permanent secretary of Lagos State Government, who is also a contributory panel member to the conversation. So you're you're very welcome, sir. It's a pleasure to have you on the show with us. Um, and deep apologies from engineer Bolarinwa. He's unable to join us because of technical issues. Um, so we're moving, we'll continue with the panel, with the panel session. Um, a, couple, a couple of us, you engineer Osad Dolo. Um, we've seen that um, the construction industry has a myriad of professionals who are working in, in the built sector. And um, the, the, clearly, they all have different roles to play. Um, but we see that specifically, um, architects and structural engineers not involved in continuous monitoring of these projects to ensure that design specifications for these proposed buildings are followed to the latter. If other professionals are being involved in the in the monitoring process, um, should what should and why aren't architects and structural engineers involved in this continuous monitoring? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, you see, uh, there are so many issues with the current uh, construction process in our country, Nigeria. There, are, there is an issue that has not yet been addressed, which is the conflict between the architects and the structural engineers. That is on one side. But now your question is, why are they not involved in continuous monitoring of projects to ensure that design specifications for the building, proposed buildings are followed to the latter? It's all about who we are as a people. You see, like um, Professor uh, Abimbola Windak of Top End said, she said something about social factors. And one of those social factors, you have this corruption, you have political interference and all that. So most people, they feel, ah, why pay an architect and also have a structural engineer on mm -hmm. site? The architect can oversee mm -hmm. what the structural engineer is doing. And sometimes some people feel, ah, why have an architect? Since I already have a structural engineer, the structural engineer can oversee what the architect is meant to do. But I tell you the truth, both of them, the architects and the structural engineers are needed on any project and they are meant to work as a team. Another thing I would like to talk about is uh, the political interferences in our project, this country. Um, a politician knows someone, for example, as an architect, and he places all his trust on that person. Whoever he meets first, he places his trust on that very person. And oftentimes, they tend to liaise with that person, not wanting a second um, professional to come in. So you see, a project goes through. You will see maybe like a high-rise building, a four-story building or a one-story building, and you think there's an engineer building it, but there is none. An architect may just be the one just taking everything. So the, the problems are much. Uh, Professor Abimbola has said, said it all. There are social reasons and other social reasons. We have corruption. We have political interference. There is, we do not value knowledge anymore. Why should I spend my money on somebody to supervise my project? I already have one person there who is a builder. He knows how to erect the pillars, the columns. He knows what a slab is and all that. So there is a lot to a lot. And you know, I'm, sometimes when I think about this collapse in Nigeria, you know, I get scared. What we are experiencing now is just a tip. It's just, it's just the beginning. In fact, I expect a lot more. Calm down. Thank you very much. Thank you for that response, um, Engineer Sadolo. I'm I move over to you, um, Professor Windapo, and I'm going to pull out some um, one of your some of your statements from your from your presentation, and it's about where you mentioned um, ethical considerations and quality input by registered professionals in the in the construction industry. So my question to you now is. Is it possible that government can institute a peer review mechanism process where designs are submitted for approval and they can be forwarded to other professionals in the built environment sector before an omnibus approval is given? So um, I know that with, with, the, with environment, there, there, there is the case of environmental impact assessment and before a final approval is given, it goes through a review process, panel session, and, and those um, stringent processes before the approval is given. Do you think that this is, 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 is a similar scenario could solve these challenges that the built sector is having in regards to building collapse? Thank you, ma'am. Well, yeah, thank you so much for your question. Um, I want to believe that the peer review process should happen within our town planning departments. So if there's any, it should happen in the government departments, it should be, because I, I, I the question I think you mean, sending it out to other engineers who are in private consulting. Is that what it means? Is that what your question means? That sending it the, the designs out to other consultants? Well, Private, well, not all, in the government department. All relevant stakeholders, if it's private, um, government, as long as yeah. they're relevant stakeholders and each person, each professional gives their input to why okay. this project should fly or not, 
Yeah. And so that is the purpose of the government approval process. So once the um, designs are submitted, so it goes through that peer review mechanism process where the designs are reviewed by the professionals in the government planning and building departments before government gives approval. So that is what happens even now. That's what should happen. That it goes so, but, but the problem we have is that this peer review process takes time. So it can take five years, it takes so long before an approval is given, even more. I'd have, uh, there's one that I'm even dealing with is over eight years now. So, but it should go through a peer review process. The um, designers should be told that these are the problems that we have that have been encountered with or the lapses in your drawings, maybe it has to be fixed. Uh, you need to provide more information. The department can ask for more information. They can ask for tests to be done before and a, a, a building permit is given. So it should provide an unbiased independent evaluation of the project to help to help ensure that the project meets the highest demand, the, the highest standards of performance. So it's here, I agree, but it should be within the government departments, it should be sent to all relevant departments in the building, uh, town planning, it's the town planning departments of uh, the local government and the state government towards ensuring they have these uh, high standards. And if there are any gaps, they should not give a building permit. They should refer it back to the designer who should fix the drawings, who should do tests, they should carry out tests and then use that to evaluate the drawings before actually issuing a permit. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for your, for your response, ma'am. Um, engineer, do you have Hello. Me? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, ma'am, I, I think let's, let's, let's take it further. Okay. Yes, we know that it is government departments and agency officers that are responsible for cross-checking and checking approval. But if we have a, a review mechanism, if we have a review mechanism where uh, government of Lagos states, there's a national body that review. Yes, government officials have gone through the drawing, they've gone through the check-ins, and we have professional body cross-checking each other, like an architect do a design, and it is sent to another architect, a senior architect to cross-check. Probably can that help us? Because everybody keep on putting the blame on government, but the people certify an architect is their professional body. They give them the certification. Most of them are fellows. Most of them are, are registered member of an association. And you find out that the building they are in charge or the structure they are in charge often fail and everybody keep on putting the blame on government. So if there's a review mechanism, okay, we ask each and every of the association to review their individual works and see maybe can that help us? And that's what I think we are, we are trying to say. It seems as if time planner was to me, Yes, yes. You see, I want to give you an insight of what is happening in Lagos State now. As a result of this incessant building collapse, I think Lagos State set up a committee recently and were all invited, I mean, the stakeholders, all the professional bodies, building, architects, engineers, town planners, name them. So they want to evolve a strategy where there will be a certifier that will encompass all the built professional. So that before a planning permit is granted, all the professional uh, members in the built environment will first of all screen your plan, your proposal, and making sure that it is perfectly all right before you proceed to obtain planning permit. I think they are now in the process of doing that. 
And I believe by the time that one really uh, takes off, it will help at reducing the use of quark and at the same time, ensuring that what you are going to put up as a structure is in compliance with building codes and all other regulations. I think with that, it will go a long way at reducing the building collapse in the state. But what we have in the past, we have agencies that are responsible for granting or planning permit. We have legal state building control agencies who that is saddled with the monitoring and issues of uh, state certification at every construction stage. And we have LASPA, which is Lagos State Building uh, Planning Permit Authority. They are the one granting planning permit for any construction. And uh, they have various departments where you have town planners, engineers, uh, name it, civil structure, that will have to evaluate your design before approval is granted. But what we used to have is that by the time planning permit is granted, it is Nigeria doesn't lack enacting laws, but for us to abide with the law is a major problem. There are cases of issuance of planning permit, having looked at all the regulations and making sure that it has passed the test of planning requirement and the approval is granted. But by the time the client goes back to the site, you now realize that it will change from the plan uh, approval granted in time of density, in time of zoning, in time of use, in time of height. So all these things attributed to what we are having today as and the resultant effect is building collapse. So for us to vet or scrutinize your pro planning, uh, proposal, it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not only the solution to the something, but the real execution of that project on site. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for weighing in in the question. I don't know if Professor Windakos still has any more comments to on this. Uh, no, I think Professor, I mean, I think Tampla Nadediri has answered the question uh, very well. The only thing that I would just add with that, I just view that involving professional bodies, which is a good idea. I think uh, I'm just looking at this as we are treating the effects and not really the cause of the problem. And Tamplana Dedere alluded to it in his submission that at the end of the day, it's the execution that matters. It's not really in the granting of time planning approval. So we are treating effects, we are not really treating the cause. I view that having that other layer again is going to introduce another layer of bureaucracy, costs, and then potential delays in the approval process. Because now you have to consult seven professional bodies in the construction industry before your approval is granted. Before we were only dealing with Las Vegas, we are dealing with LASPA. It takes five years, it takes eight years before you get your planning permit. And some people don't even get these permits before they start construction. So now I'm saying more seven bodies, seven professional bodies have to vet it again. Then we are in, in, in extending the time and bureaucracy. That's just my view. Uh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I hope that the government can find a way around this, considering the fact that you've also highlighted that this might bring another layer of bureaucracy. And we do know what bureaucracy does to processes um, elongates time and that's more incurred cost for developers which they're already trying to avoid so then um then, then, then we need to find a way they can move around this thing these factors without necessarily compromising on quality and standards for to meet the, the, the quality of the project that they're delivering to to their end users thank you ma'am thank you i think i think Dede wants to respond thank you okay You, you can go ahead and speak, sir. Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> uh, Professor Abimbola did mention that at times it takes two, five years before planning permit could be granted. Uh, honestly, 
and working within the terrain in Lagos State and obtaining planning permits in the state, there are a lot of things that can cause delay in granting planning permits. And we've been advising government so as to make sure that uh, at least you obtain your planning permit within a time uh, frame, say within 30 working days, it is doable and they've been trying at last part. Uh, but unlike before, if you are talking of two, three, four, five years ago, I will subscribe to that statement that it may take you one year or two years before planning permit is granted. But as of today, the status quo now is that you, your application must have been screened, get the necessary assessment fees payable to the government, and make sure that all the documents required in terms of survey plan, soil test, technical report, engineering drawings, and all the rest are readily available before your application will be accepted at the ministry. And once it is certified to be okay, and you are ready and they register your plan, you are sure of getting your approval. And the only thing that usually causes delay is in the area of tax payment. Because you see many people being paid the statutory fees, and by the time they're giving, they are given the registration number, they just went home, hoping that the approval will come out. But if all those planning requirements are not submitted, your client may, I mean, your, your, your consultant may tell you that, okay, it's coming, but they will be deceiving themselves. Whereas the client may not have, uh, may not have been paid their, 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 their tax, this remittance to the state government. And without issuance of your tax uh, certificate clearance, they won't, they won't release the approval. So, but we are trying to encourage government that they should separate the EU of tax from planning permit granted. Once your proposal meets the planning requirement and you pay, you are able to pay the statutory fees, let the planning permit be granted onto the owner. Instead of, because planning should not be an appendage of uh, LRS, Internal Revenue uh, District. But what we are now saying here is this, the government still insisted that tax must be paid. And this tax we are talking about is not just your pay as you want. I am bold to say, because they look at the quantum of development you want to uh, 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 consult on site, and they will use that as the basis of your tax. And we used to tell the government that, okay, somebody that wanted to at least have an edifice on his, soul, on his head, and the government will now say, because you want to build at Ikoyi, and you should be paying so, so, so amount of money without not knowing whether you want to go and borrow or you want you rely on your family member to, to support you before you have your construction work. But, and this is still a proposal, but they want you to pay the tax. And that is why you now see people maneuvering within the system by not even coming or showing up to the government to obtain the planning permit. So if we still continue in that manner, there is no way we would stop building collapse. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. A um, few points that you've highlighted here. Tax should not be related to, to building projects. Yes. And because of what you've just mentioned, I'm going to have to invite um, the past permanent sec secretary of Lagos State Government, Engineer DME, just to provide his thoughts on this, because I know that if, um, and just as the example that you have cited, if someone wants to put up a structure in, in Ikoyi, I don't believe that the person is going ahead to borrow for residential purposes, even if he's putting up residential, um, if a residential structure, he's putting up a residential structure for commercial, for commercial, for sale at commercial rates. So um, obviously he's, he's going, he's proceeding to, to the bank for some loan and he must have a, a quality of, a good quality of um, collateral to put down for this project because these projects that we're talking about are in tens of billions. So I'd like me, um, Engineer Adeyemi mean, just to weigh in on this because the, pa the past permanent secretary and maybe he can shed more light on the issues of tax for government and this this topic that we're having a, that we're having a conversation about. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, moderator. 
Uh, am I on? Yes, we can hear you, yes. sir. Uh, sincerely, do I join the conversation very late, but I really I so much appreciate uh, your program. And I would have loved, unfortunately, for us to have such a discussion on a bigger media where everybody will be able to ask questions and people can listen to the professor to see what she has just presented. Sincerely, I so, I'm so happy that uh, she went so deep into the rudiment of uh, project construction. And she was able to deliver all those problems, the, the infractions. She was able to identify all the infra infractions associated with uh, building collapse. Since I, uh, the professor that has just spoken made mention of the issue of task clearance. Hello? Hello? We can hear you, sir. You're live, yeah. sir. Yes. Uh, she, he made mention of the issue of task clearance. It's more than that. Yeah, at some instance, you'll be asked to go and bring your CFO. And you know how many houses, how many uh, men, properties have CFO in Lagos? I have seen what is going on in, I know what is going on in Lansbury and other, and all other government establishment. For you to get a CFO, it may take you up to three years. So, you know, so yeah, the whole system is so cumbersome. It's so cumbersome. I just wish uh, one of these days we want, you will provide or you will schedule another session of this discussion where I will be able to help you or assist you in inviting who is who in the legal states construction industry as it is related to the government uh, structure. That is uh, from the PS uh, physical planning to the PS uh, to the GM uh, lab. There are so many agencies that are involved. There are so many bottlenecks and all the rest. So that is why people short cut corners. That is why people dodge the government to erect whatever they want to erect in terms of structures. So, you know, the whole system is cumbersome. And I, I believe if I am able to, if we are able to invite those who are on the hot seats to come here and join this discussion, maybe in a bigger scale, on a bigger scale, maybe in a bigger media, then you'll be able to see what is really happening. No, the last speaker threw some light into what is really happening, but it goes beyond the issue of tax. You will be asked to, you will be asked to submit certain different uh, I mean, you know, so many requirements will be made to, to fulfill. So I don't really know. No, I retired as a permanent secretary. I was never involved in, uh, in building. I was in the environment, and I can speak more about the environment, but I know what happens there. So I want to thank again the uh, organizer of this program. I wish you could do the same thing again, where I will be able to invite, assist the organizer to get in touch with who is who. Who will partake, but it has to be in a larger scale. It won't be at this level. You know, we are having about 10 participants. That is not enough for public enlightenment. So thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, yeah. just to yeah. inform our panelists that we are actually live on YouTube. So yeah. yes, you're in the Zoom room, but we have our audience on on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, actually listening in on the conversation. So not to worry about um, just the number of participants that you see in the Zoom room. We're actually live on YouTube and we're doing our best to bring the questions in from YouTube into the Zoom room so that we can ask people just because we wanted to get the conversation started initially. And that's why we started with, with asking the panelist members and we would actually, um, we would actually magnify the voices of our audience by asking their questions. Um, so thank you very much, Engineer DME, for your contributions. You're welcome. Um, but actually, I have a follow-up question for you, sir. Yes. Um, and it's also because you worked in the government and you're the only government representative that we have in the room at the moment. So no, I, I represent myself. I'm not representing <laughs> the government. I, I, I'm representing my head and my legs too. <laughs> I'm talking as Engineer DME, not as a government agent. Okay, Go ahead, That's noted. Um, so, in terms of building collapse and how long we, how long the the, fre the frequency, and we we do know that building collapse investigations are carried out. Should government actually have um, revealed the identity of these developers, and maybe sort of back blacklist them? Maybe other people would have other professionals would have moved away from them not to use them because they have a, they have a bad, a bad track record or it's governments doing justice by keeping by keep keeping their um and and their anon, an, anonymity away from the public and people keep using this and we're seeing that it's probably the same developers and this is not a fact a, i'm not this is not a fact that i'm putting out here but maybe it's there's a very likelihood that is certain developers who are having this constant track record of building collapse. 
your suggestions, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, in Lagos, Lagos State is a big construction site. Lagos State is a very big construction. You have development going on here and there. Who is the developer? Nobody, they don't, people don't repeat developers. People just go ahead and do any, whatever they want to do. Look at the uh, Ikuyi, uh, the Ikuyi property owner that died in the construction, the collapse. He was the one, he was the whole, uh, he was the engineer, he was the, the architect, was everything. So understand? So people don't, it's not as if there's a particular developer that is going on doing rubbish everywhere. No, in, in, as it is today, Everybody is an, is an expert to himself. Everybody is, a, is an architect, is an engineer. All the developers are engineers on their own. Go to Lagos Island, go and see the, go and see the rot in Lagos Island. Go and see what's going on there. Eh? You will agree with me that there is a, we still have a lot of work to do, sincerely. It, it, it goes beyond what we are discussing. I, I thank God the presenter, the professor, uh, uh, I forgot her name now, did a very good work. You know, she extracted everything. And I so love it. I would love to have a soft copy, a copy of this uh, presentation, sincerely. So, you know, it goes beyond the issue of a particular developer. Everybody is doing every, whatever they like. You organize a thousand, 1,001 agencies to supervise the construction in Lagos. They cannot catch up with the rate of development. They can never catch up. So I just feel that we need to copy a model somewhere else. Maybe we need to go to UK or South Africa, where my professor is, and see how, what, you know, in other areas, in other clients, it's the local government that manage the local government, uh, uh, go, uh, go, that manage construction in other clients. But in Lagos, you only have an office of the Ministry of Physical Planning in local government. So everything is pulled down back to Alausa. They have district offices, very cumbersome system. Understand? So everything you submit, if you submit a building approval in uh, Lekki, and you submit another one in Amu World, of, everything will be taken to the district office for visit office now to to uh to allow sir so the whole thing is you know the, uh, you know so that is what it is so we need to involve a system uh, that has worked elsewhere that is that is what i think we need to do and uh, somebody has to come out and tell us this is how it is done so at so, so, so place and this is how it is done at another place before we can come up with a clear a clean clear procedure but this, oh, whatever we are doing now sincerely is it's a bit of effort but then sincerely it, it, it gets so messy. If you go to this, if you go in depth into the uh, uh, what is going on in uh, getting uh, an approval or in building construction in uh, in Lagos State, particularly, uh, how do you look at? Go to Lekki, go and see what is going on in Lekki. Go to go, go to go to the area. Go to this place where they call uh, what they call this place now Agungi. Go and see how people are building houses. People are building houses at the level of the lagoon, like at the lagoon level. They are foundation level is at, at par with the lagoon level. Eh? So how do you, who, how, how, many, how many areas are you going to visit? How many areas will you be able to identify? How many uh, infrastructure are you going to be are you going to identify? The whole system is, is a big rot. And I really, I still believe that uh, we need to do more. It's good that a few people are coming together to talk about this issue. Maybe uh, at the end of the day, something good will come out of this. Sincerely, I would love to have a copy of the presentation by the prof. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Yep. Um, yeah. Two things I took out of your comments are decentralizing the process and maybe introducing technology into to make um, process, um, approval processes a bit swifter than, than, we are, than it's obtainable at the moment. Um, I'm coming back to you, Professor Windako. Um, are there any existing links to safety risk of buildings associated with changes in weather patterns, which, which could be contributing to increasing building collapse? I know that you've mentioned building on site selection mm. and the type of um, land that you're even building on, but with, ex with current weather patterns changing on a daily basis, do you think there might be any safety risk associated with this? Mm. Yeah, um, there's a growing body of research that shows uh, that changes in weather patterns may be contributing to, may, it could be contributing factors to the increasing building collapses. Uh, you know, we now have heavier rainfalls. Um, if you look at the rainfall pattern. And um, so there's a group, I'm on a group well, BCBG, you see, they'll say when rain starts to fall now, there'll be more building collapse. So it's something that there's a projection into the future with that. 
rain, the rainfall is becoming heavier. So heavy rainfall, uh, we are now having heat waves. And with all these things, flooding, rainfall, very heavy ones, there's a large amount of flooding and floods will destroy the foundation of the building if it doesn't even carry it away. So very strong floods, they even in some parts of, there was very heavy rainfall in South Africa last year in some parts of uh, Durban, unseen before. It was even, I don't know if this happened in Lagos, has happened in Lagos, but the ocean, it wasn't even because of the rainfall, the ocean rose to a certain level, rose about 13 meters. And so buildings that were next to the ocean, so something like that lakey, imagine if the ocean, the Atlantic should rise to a level of about 13 meters, how many buildings would collapse? So many buildings collapsed, many lives were lost because of the rise in the ocean levels. So all this is due to the changes that we are seeing in the weather patterns. And it can put additional strain on the buildings if it doesn't even uh, make the building collapse. So heavy rainfall and floods can lead to soil erosion and destabilization, which may weaken the foundation of buildings and lead to structural damage and collapse. Heat waves, can cause expansion and contraction of the uh, steel structure. If we use steel, like the steel beams, or we use uh, steel in buildings or concrete structures. So it can cause the expansion and contraction, especially buildings that were not properly designed, that don't have expansion joints. So some of those, you see the bridges are being repaired sometimes. They say they are changing the expansion joints. Some of our buildings with, um, extensive concrete structures and elements, they don't have expansion joints. So the heat waves that we are having these days can lead to those expansion and contraction. And with that, over time, it will lead to the destruction of that particular structure and then can lead to the failure of the building. So long-term changes in weather patterns, such as the rising temperatures and changing uh, precipitation patterns, the rainfall that we have, heavy flooding, rain can also cause extreme weather e events leading to an increase in the number of building collapse. I absolutely agree. So we have to be careful as we go on with these uh, changes in weather patterns. Thank you. Thank you, Ma, for your insights. Um, just the comments that I have that has come on, that has come in now is, that the build sector should allow geoscientists take charge of the integral part of building, which is the foundation, imaging of substrata, soil characterization, among other things in the subsurface. So now we're even seeing the incorporation of another professional, of other of another professional coming to the build sector, which should be the geoscientist. Um, builder, Akinshala, I come over to you, sir. Um, as a builder, what steps can be taken to prevent building collapse in Lagos and by extension, all of the states where building collapse has been prevalent? Hello, sir. Uh, let me unmute you. Yes. Not clearly, sir. What I'm saying is that. Can I ask that you bring the. Hello? Um, it's quite faint, sir. I think the fan, the fan is contributing to. Yes, and maybe he can take off the earphones, actually. If I may ask that you take off the earphones, sir, that might be better. I don't know why you are not hearing me here. It's not audible. It's better now. Okay, like I said, um, Professor Winterford mentioned of the issues that we can take to uh, ensure that we arrest the incessant building collapse in Lagos State. 
and most of the contributors have also mentioned. The only issue we've been discussing so far are the issues that are connected to social factors, which are human elements. And even this human element we are discussing is just part of it, not everything. The issue of substandard material is there, not, not discussed. Uh, when in your intro, you mentioned the, uh, the presence of standard organization of Nigeria, but you know the habit in Nigeria is that when you want to build, a research has shown that 80% of development in Nigeria is done by an individual, just like the former PS of the environmental mentioned. It's not uh, big people or, uh, or government or corporate body. Individual, 80% of construction going on in Nigeria, or even in Lagos, which is a subset of Nigeria, uh, is being done by uh, individual. And if that is true, they, I want to buy material for my project. There is no regulatory process for ensuring that materials I'm getting from the market is a standard material. I go to the market by reinforcement. Nobody goes to the market with calipers to, to measure whether it is actual diameter, and nobody goes to the laboratory to analyze whether the reinforcement has the required yield stress specified by the engineer before it is used on site. In the big project, in the past, it is normal that when the consultant comes to site, he cut part of the reinforcement, send it to laboratory analysis before it is used. The other materials are also done like that, cement and other things, before they can be approved for use. A builder is trained for quality assurance. We have a system of training that comply with ISO 10002 for quality assurance. And in that system, when you bring the materials to site, you check and inspect. When you inspect that materials and it has not been tested for analysis, you do not approve it for use. When it has been tested and the result is not yet out, it can only be put, you can only put a yellow flag on it, not a green flag. It is only material that you have a green flag on that can be used for construction on site. But we are not following all those procedures again. On the, when you get to the site today, any materials on site are being used. Nobody knows which one has been tested or analyzed, which one was mm -hmm. tested, tested to ensure the quality assurance is, uh, is, is ensured. Now, the builders are trained in a way to ensure that not only health and safety, not only quality assurance, they ensure that the building production management process of the construction follow the standard set up for it. And they aggregate all this construction process using the input of all the sub, all the consultants involved in the project, the structural engineering design, the architectural design, the mechanical engineering and electrical engineering design are put together by the builders mm -hmm. side to ensure that compliance is enforced. However, where this register builder or otherwise known as professional builder, not contractor builder that we normally say in the media. Contractor builder may not be a registered builder, may not be a professional builder. Where the contractor is now being referred to as a builder is not a builder, but a builder is somebody who is professionally licensed by Council of Registered Builders of Nigeria to construct and, and, and carry out building production management process on site. So where is involved, he ensured that the quality associated with each consultant work are carried out on site. And when they come, they go through what they have, they have set out in their design to ensure that the builder who is managing the building production process follow the due process that they have carried out in their design. And if these are done, there won't be much problem. Somebody asked a question about geotechnical uh, process before works are done. That is true. It is part of the structure, uh, the technical work, soil mechanic, soil soil investigation. We are talking about is very very important. Of recent, I have a project in a Dolphin Estate, and my my client was telling me, okay, uh, we I told him to do a soil test. He said, okay, we just at the at the most very close here. We did a soil test there, and because the soil test is very close to this place, and I told him soil strata mm has -hmm. like it. It is not the same thing. Within one meter distance, there could be different strat stratum of soil. So we have to carry out a different soil uh, test. And when we did, it was different from what they did at the mosque. 
So we should ensure that proper things are done, no, not looking at the cost involved. And the cost that we are always protecting is insignificant to the cost of the construction itself. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm showing you the picture. Uh, uh, let me show you. Let me show a picture. And yeah, this is a structure in one of the higher institution in Nigeria. And this structure was built around ten or fifteen years ago. Now they are adding another structure on top. They are adding another structure on top. This is an institution that is, that is training people on building in Nigeria. Now they are adding other structures on it. And you can see they are adding the pillar inside. I don't know, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not a builder. Can they, can they tell me that the integrity, the piling they did for this building 10 years ago and carry this? What is the justification? Why an I institution where we have professionals who are training people in the building sector are doing this? I, 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 can you help me with this? For my own layman knowledge, is this acceptable? Can any of the panelists just help us with this? Because if people like us who are not in the professional sector, in the building sector are saying this, this is a building that has been done 10 years ago and they are adding another building by just putting columns in it. Can they, did they, can they tell me that the initial piling they did for this building, it's enough to carry it. Is it only the piling, the pillars, or the integrity, the piling they did for the building initially? Thank you very much, sir. Um, engineer Osadolo, I'll let you speak because you have your hand raised and maybe we can go back to that, inshallah. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Um, was, I think it was you just um, showed us a photograph of um, a story building having another one on it. You see, everything is possible. There are processes you go through in ensuring that the uh, building is you know, um, robust enough to take another floor. So we never can tell they may have um, designed this very structure to have that floor maybe some 10, 15, 15 years back and they may not have put it there. So there are current tests that may have been done. We never, as you never can tell. So I do not know if those who decided to have that um, extension on it have done the required thing, but if they've done what is required and have certified it to be okay, then why not? Everything is, is possible. You know, I, there is a structure I have in Benin. Uh, I inherited it from my dad and it's meant to be a story building and he just did just the ground floor. And um, I'm planning to complete it. And that building is close to 20 years. So before I complete, I will have to do a design for the upper floor and do all the necessary checks. If they all pass my structural um, requirement, then why not? I'll put it there. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's possible. Nothing is impossible. But there are processes you have to go through. Ensure you check the foundation again. Ensure you check the columns the, on the, um, from the ground floor that they are strong enough to have the upper floors. And if they are not, there's a way you can transfer the load not to the current foundation, but create a new foundation for this same structure. So it's possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can speak, you can speak, sir. You. for eight story, but they were not able to fund it for eight floors. They only funded it for four stories, four floors. But now that the fund has taken it over to ensure that the additional four floors are added, they are relying on the previous foundation that has been done. But before they did that, they did a lot of tests to ensure that what they had in terms of integrity in the, in the past 15 years was the same as of today before they added the additional floor. Like Engineer Ozadolo said, it is not impossible if every check and balances are put in place. Thank you. 
So if I'm examining other, other sir, why why I'm asking why I'm asking that question is those are the those are the information uh, the professionals the academicians need to put into the public. If you look at buildings building collapse in 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 Lagos and in Nigeria, people always wants to add another building or another structure on top based on the justification that somebody else has done it. But the example you gave now, there are things that has been done. Those, that plan, the building was supposed to be eighth floor and it was meant for fourth floor because of fun. But people who are comparing that building outside will not know that. So uh, that, I think it is now left for professionals to put that information in, in, in space so that People who are not really familiar with all those uh, tests. Okay, yes, if you want to add buildings to another floor to your building, these are the necessary steps you must take. Uh, that, that's just my observation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for this um, enlightening panel session. Um, Tamar Dejure, I'd like to come back to you, sir. Um, yes, you see that with, the, with how building collapse happens, um, the hospitals that the that that the those involved in building collapse um, are usually miles away from 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 them. Um, should hospital retainership be a, a monitoring condition for construction sites, particularly as an occupational safety and health condition, before approvals are given to to these it, developers? It does depends. Honestly, with the government policies that are in place coupled with all various agencies and the new proposal that the professionals should be involved in monitoring of uh, construction sites. Uh, as earlier mentioned by Professor Abimola, you see, by the time we are adding series of agencies, individuals, corporations, doing monitoring of buildings, on the process for approval, it made things to be too cumbersome. Presently, if you want to go on high-rise structure, they require you to have a kind of insurance cover. And uh, by the time we are now adding additional hospital, I don't think hospitals are trained to, uh, doctors are trained to, to, to construct uh, buildings. But to me, personally, I don't see any need for that. But with the status quo, honestly speaking, by the time you adhere strictly to the instruction, you apply your building code, you follow the planning procedure, and the, all the engineers, builders are doing their job, I don't think it is necessary. And honestly, while a uh, professor was delivering his pe uh, paper, uh, we talk of trading of artisans and all the rest. You see, the quantum of develop, uh, the, the collapse we are having in the state is due to poor materials, using of incompetent professionals, cutting corners. And that is why I quite subscribe to what the professor said, that there is need for ethical reorientation. If you really address strictly to the ethics of our profession, we won't be having all this uh, issues of building collapse. Somebody was saying. I'm sorry saying to that, uh, Okay. Yes, for my, I'm not sure you 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 quite understood the question. Um, okay. Occupational health and safety hazards ha experts have seen that death is is like the cat. That's the casual. That's those are that's the prim that's the pr primary fatality that that happens to workers on site. Yes. So should hospital retainership for these workers be okay. a condition? Okay, I, can, I get you right. Yes, sir. Honestly, that is fantastic. It is a welcome development. It will be a welcome development because uh, the loss of lives and properties we are experiencing in the state and in the country is becoming something enormous. And by the time we put that in place, I think it goes a long way at committing whoever that is responsible for that. 
Thank you, sir. Um, Bill Dakinshala, you have your hands raised, sir. You can speak, sir. I said the law is already in place. There is a Lagos State Safety Commission law, B, and there is Lagos State uh, law that require that builder's documents should be submitted for approval. And among those documents are project health and safety plan. And in this project health and safety plan, there is what we call emergency response plan, which is mandatory that there should be a retainership of an hospital very close to the site before the commencement of the construction work, the contractor or the client should have a retainership of an hospital very close, not a, a distant one to the site. Not only that, you must also locate a fire station not too far from the site and register a site with the police. And also a Latham bus location, that is Lagos State Ambulance Services, that is very near to the site in case of emergency. These are provisions that are inputted in the uh, project health and safety plan that is mandatorily submitted for approval process. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you very much, sir. Why, why we are asking this question? Uh, if you know, any, during the emergency, when any building collapse in Lagos State, most of the victims are actually taken to government hospitals. And this overstretch the existing uh, facility. If, according to you, your statement, you said every building should, in their plan, have an emergency response plan. Why can't those buildings take those patients or those people involved in those things to the hospitals that have they have retainership with? Why are we stretching government facilities? Why is it that it is government that often take up the responsibility of a building collapse when the situation happened? Yes, a building got an approval and there's an hospital 100 or 50 meter away. Because if you look at it, most of the debt most of the deaths are actually because it takes longer time for those people to be moved to the treatment facility. That is why we are asking that question. Thank you. Do you want me to comment on that? Most of the buildings, the government has come out to say they are not approved. So they don't have project health and safety plan. If it is approved, yes, they can have project health and safety plan. But if it is not approved, they don't have project health and safety. It is what you have, it is when you have planned against an occurrence that you can mitigate against it. Because they didn't have approval, they did not have project health and safety plan. That is one reason what that we are saying that we have beautiful law in Lagos State. Enforcement is another thing. The issues of enforcement of those beautiful laws is one issue that we have to battle with in Lagos State. Government will roll out laws, they will not enforce them. And that is the result of what we have seen. So many people are dying because these laws are not enforced. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I just want to read a few of our audience's um, um, reactions to the conversation. Um, someone has said, knowledge transfer and training for artisans and engineers self-regulation aside government regulations could be the way forward. Um, another viewer has said, control agencies should make one of their staff available throughout the construction period for every building that is from two-story buildings upwards to avoid compromising standards. Okay. And lastly, the build sector should allow geoscientists take charge of the, okay, we've taken that comment before. So I just want to say thank you so much to every of our panelists and I'd like to get your closing thoughts on this conversation in no particular order. Um, as you all feel comfortable to, you can please take up the mic and give us your closing thoughts. Uh, when we were planning development law, most of the new talks that have been generated today were discussed there at 
the Durban Hotel. The idea to use consultants simultaneously to enforce and ensure that compliance are carried, are enforced, were mooted at that venue. But later, government gets in it. And today, they are going back to it. The multi layers of uh, consultants that we're talking about. It's not the problem. The problem is government staff. Most of the laws that we put in place that are in the act and bills, these staffs are manipulating them for selfish gains. And we have to let we have to tell the truth. The fact remains that until the staff are called to order and government put a control system in position to check that these staff are not lying. Unfortunately, we've lost him there. Um, in their pocket, at the expert. Yes, I was just going to say if we might turn off your video to save bandwidth, sir. But you're muted at the moment. Okay, while we wait for him to get back, um, Tampa, are you ready for okay. your? Yes, sir? yes, sir. Thank you. Honestly, my take on this EU of building collab. A lot of reasons have been adduced to the reason why buildings are collapsing in the state. But I want to make to believe that among all those reasons why building collapse, the social factor, the technological factor, environmental factors, the, the father of all of them is the managerial factor. Because if professionals are up to their responsibility, some of these uh, reasons can be, can be reduced. There is need for ethical orientation. And looking at the whole scenario, the builders, in fact, we are all involved. And all the professionals, apart from the, uh, the developers or the client, the professionals that are on site, how many times do they visit site to monitor what they are paid for? If your clients are claiming that this is what you want to do and you realize that what is telling you to do is wrong, it's against your professional ethics, you better bow out of the system. So as to let the developer know that is at fault. But because we are looking for money rather than our integrity, and that is why we are experiencing building collapse in the state. Where are you supposed to buy your materials? If you see a standard block, you will know now, but what you are using, honestly, you will see other construction work on site and you'll be experiencing both vertical and horizontal cracking. And that is to tell you that there is a fault. And the moment you are experiencing this, the resultant effect is to collapse. So until we have a change of attitude, because majorly, apart from the environmental factor where rain can, or flooding can affect your structure, but it is very negligible. But the major thing, we need to have a change of attitude and for us to at least do the needful. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your thoughts. Um, Engineer Sadalo? Okay. Um, if he's not ready, I don't know if Professor Abimbala is ready. You're muted, ma'am. Yes, <laughs> just realized that. 
<clears throat> so thank you so much uh, for this uh, very engaging discussion. I just want to thank you. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. So, But I think from all what we've said so far, my closing remarks are that we need to try as much as possible to separate the causes, the causes of building collapse from what the effects of the causes of building collapse are. So we need to be able to streamline. I think it's essential because we are getting more, the, while trying to treat the effects, we are loading more and more policies, regulations, things that have to be done, are making it more unaffordable. It's going to be more because as I mentioned, the economic condition as well has a huge role to play on the, is related to the number of collapsing buildings that we have. So the more we try and treat the effects, the more we need to load the uh, activities that has to be carried out, which comes with a certain costs to the clients. So my view is that we need a structure that is, has to be streamlined, more efficient, uh, we need to get to the root cause, which I think has been mentioned, which is like the managerial factors and the unheeding factors. So many unheeding factors, what goes on behind this thing? We need to get to those factors, especially the ethical uh, factors, the ethics of not only the profession, because you have people who... Uh, it has been mentioned that there are certain people who take on the role. Once you get, once you appoint an architect, then they believe they have to do everything. If it's the architect you meet first, then they do everything. So there needs to be uh, a kind of ethics of the profession. And I think somebody also mentioned self-regulation. You know, how can we make sure that we encourage people to self-regulate? How can we encourage our developers, our clients to self-regulate themselves, to be more ethical? Because these are the root causes. These are things we can't get to. We don't need so much regulation. Regulation is costly. We don't need so much regulation and have a fire safety, um, be able to contact um, the uh, accident emergency unit, you know? It's going to layer costs which the clients cannot afford. But the clients themselves, we, if they were able to self-regulate themselves, if they were ethical, they know they don't have to cut corners, they don't go and buy substandard materials because they can't afford it. They pay for the services of their designers, the engineers, the professional builders, the people who are going to manage the process for them. They pay and all this, and then government doesn't have to add all this layer. So it's a reaction of government. So we have to get to the root cause. That's my own submission. We have to get to the root cause of this problem and, and, and stop it at the root cause so that we don't have to police people to do what they are supposed to do in the first case. They must realize that policing brings about costs. And in talking about policing, I think the government should also, maybe there should be an award. They should be giving people awards. So we only hear about the negative side. What's that about the people who are doing the right things? What has been done to encourage them? What about those developers who and the clients who are doing the right thing, building the right structures? What efforts have we done to encourage them to say, you've done well? Maybe there could be awards. Las Vica Awards at the end of the year for buildings that are doing the right thing, for clients that are doing the right thing. Give them awards, appreciate them. Tax relief, we heard about tax just now. Very high tax because you are building in Okoyi and they said this uh, development is going to be worth billions of naira. So are you paying a tax of 100,000 or 500,000? What about tax relief to people, to developers who are doing the right thing? Okay, you are going to do the right thing. Get a tax relief. I think we need to nip the 
course is the course that we have to make. People must self-regulate. The government must appreciate people who are doing the right thing. And then we must streamline our regulation process as much as possible. We should get to the root cause of the problem instead of adding and adding more regulations. Building will still continue to collapse if we don't get to the root cause, which are the unseen things. There are certain things we can't see. And that is where self-regulation comes in. Uh, I think there's a Yoruba saying that I'd rather look more or something like that. So unless people have made to do the right thing, buildings will still collapse. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, Engineer Sandalo, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, I want to thank the organizers of this event for this um, gathering. And um, I just hope, or we just hope that, you know, a lot will improve after today. Now, from um, what um, I've um, come to learn about the need for ethical reorientation, it is very, very, very important. We all know ourselves as Nigerians, we know how we think. So what is happening out there in the form of building collapse is just an expression of who we are. It's a total definition of an average Nigerian. And that is what has brought about this um, collapse of buildings. So with what um, Professor Abimbola has said, she has you know, spoken a lot and I just hope that you know, things will begin to improve and then we'll have less of this um, collapse. You know, it's, um, it's disturbing sometimes when I think about it. When you think about the lives that are lost, you think about the, 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 um, the, um, uh, the financial losses, you think about the time, you think about the uh, greenhouse effects of this um, collapse, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible. So we just hope that things will change in our country, Nigeria. We'll change the way we think will change the way the, the decisions we make. A man who is an architect should not be a structural engineer on the project. A structural engineer should not be an architect. An electrical person should not be a project manager. You know, so there should be ethical reorientation, not just on, um, not just for the government workers, but on our own sites as professionals. And um, sorry to say this, we just hope also that uh, the, the, the government workers will help a lot to see that things change in our country. So thank you very much, Professor Bimbola, uh, Engineer Adedire, and uh, Engineer Ayodhi Labor and one, everybody. I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you, pleasure is ours to have you here. Um, Engineer Adeyemi, any final thoughts, sir? Well, I see closer to the whole, uh, to the event, my immediate reaction or uh, conclusion is that, uh, uh, though I've made mention of it earlier, on, let's look for a model elsewhere. Let's see how it is done elsewhere. The situation as it is in Lagos, I doubt you can really get uh, a way out of it. I said there are so many agencies of government. In charge, in charge of building approval. So many agencies of government. There are so many players on the field. How do they do it elsewhere? How do they achieve results in UK? How do they achieve results in, uh, in, in South Africa? You know, I made mention of it the other time. In some other areas, approval starts and stops at the local government level. You know, in the state, you have, about, you have almost about six agencies of government working on the building approval. You know, so I just wish that uh, I will continue to have this sort of this, uh, this same uh, type of discussion every now and then. And at the end of the day, of the day we'll have a breather. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so now it's officially the wrap of the panel session. Um, I'd my pleasure to invite Esther to give the closing remark. And after that, Mr. Dio will be giving the vote of thanks on behalf of the Equine Virus Hope team. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of um, 
the team of Equal Environment Talks, we would like to appreciate all our um, panelists and our leaders and uh, Mrs. Abimbola with that for, for that wonderful presentation and to all our panelists for their contribution towards the topic. Um, so far, we've been able to also gather some of the information and suggestions, comments from the audience that joined through the YouTube. And um, we hope that um, the necessary organizations and agency that are involved in buildings in Lagos State and in Nigeria generally will be, you know, enlightened and um, giving the suggestions and the comments that we have. Um, the likes of, I, I know we have the likes of the Ministry of Physical Planning and Urban Development in Lagos State. We have the likes of the uh, Lagos State uh, Building Permits. We have the uh, Lagos State uh, Agency in charge of building permits. So all these agencies will be getting in touch with, with, our, with the comments and suggestions that we have and the conclusions that we both add uh, I, with the panelists. I'm sure now we have a conclusion that uh, at least it's now, it's not just the government's responsibility. It's also something that has to center to our individual contributions as an agency, as a member of um, a member of an organization or a government bodies that we need to come together and make sure that we try and um, look into the issues that we have with our building constructions that after what caused um, a lot of building collapses. So we would like to appreciate everybody and we we'll, um, thank you for your time. And uh, we promise that all the suggestions and comments will be passed across to the necessary agency. Thank you so much. Mr. Dyer, you can go ahead and do Thank you. I believe there is a thing or two that we can glean from the creator's wisdom. The Bible described two types of builders. The first is described as the foolish builder. Foolish because he built his house on a sandy soil. The rain came, the wind came, and the storm came, and hit against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The second kind of builder is the wise builder. Wise because he built his house on a rocky foundation, on a solid foundation. The rain came, the wind came, and the storm came and hit against the house. And it did not fall because it was founded upon the rock. Thank you, our panelists and our lead speaker for enlightening us about the policies, the guidelines for building enduring structures. We hope that after now, Nigeria and Nigerians can be building enduring structures that will be safe for all. Thank you, the moderators. Thank you, uh, our sponsors. Thank you, our viewers from YouTube. Thank you. Until next time, it's bye for Echo Enviro TV Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mark.